Welcome everybody to DMB's five minute briefings. I'm Neil Ishwood, an SME and strategy leader in our third party risk and compliance line of business. This is part one of two, where we will look at the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act and the knock on effect it has to ultimate beneficial ownership information. This act was passed in March this year. This was one of the fastest pieces of legislation in this area that we have seen pushed through. The situation in Ukraine clearly added huge focus to this, and it meant that everyone was keen to get it through as fast as possible. This act consisted of a number of areas. It included reforms of the unexplained wealth orders. These were brought in with the Criminal Finances Act 2017, and these were targeted at people involved with organized crime and overseas politically exposed people. They allow law enforcement to apply for a court order requiring someone to detail their interest in the assets or property under question and explain how they obtained it and with what funds. If they are unable to provide any sort of evidence, then the assets can be made subject to civil recovery. An example of these is the UWO made against Zamira Hajieva, wife of jailed banker Jahangir Hajiev who investigators said earned a salary of $70,000 in 2008, yet owned four mansions in the UK, plus a $42 million Gulfstream jet. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison, charged with plundering Azerbaijan's state bank. Samira spent £16 million in Harrods over a decade, and it was claimed she owned £22 million worth of property in the UK at the time of the order. She appealed the order, which was rejected by the Supreme Court. However, despite a handful of high profile cases, up to February 2022, only nine orders had been issued, of which three were in 2018, six in 2019, and none have been issued since then. The reforms attempt to address this by making them easier to obtain and pursue including being able to target responsible officers such as directors that own property and also introduced an alternative test as opposed to suspecting someone's lawful income is not sufficient they may now also look to show there are reasonable grounds for suspecting the property was obtained by unlawful conduct and it also limits the liability of the enforcement authorities in terms of paying the costs in legal proceedings relating to the order Moving on to sanctions, post-Brexit, the UK introduced the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act 2018, or SAMLA. Previously, the majority of UK sanctions came from obligations under the United Nations and European Union. After exiting Europe, the UK needed a new framework to implement these sanctions and other regimes it sees fit. This gave the UK the ability to create its own lists or regimes for example, around gross human rights violations, often referred to as the Magnitsky sanctions. Samler gave ministers in the Secretary of State and the Treasury powers to designate persons if they felt it appropriate, which at the time was a lower threshold that did receive some criticism. The UK currently operates over 35 regimes, ranging from country-specific sanctions like Russia and North Korea, through to targeting specific terrorist groups like, like Al-Qaeda. The changes as part of this act aim to reduce the administrative burden and time to designate a person. It provides an urgent procedure allowing ministers to designate where they consider it is in the public interest to do so. This will most likely be used to designate people that have already been designated on other international lists, such as from the EU, USA, Canada, and some others. It also introduces a strict liability test. Previously, they had to show that the relevant person had knowledge or reasonable cause to suspect that a transaction was in breach of sanctions before it could impose a fine. The act removes the part now around having knowledge or reasonable course, and hence this is a lower threshold still. It will also have the power to publicly name and shame those that have breached sanctions, even if they have not imposed a fine in that particular instance. SAMLA also required a minister to personally review a financial penalty if requested. The act now allows this task to be delegated in an attempt to streamline the process. 
In part two, we will take a closer look at the register of overseas entities and the company's house reforms. So please also take a look at that briefing. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions in these areas, please contact us using the details on screen.